Good morning, everybody. I hope you're looking forward to a second day of a terrific leadership conference. A few details before we start. I will put in the chat where you can find your session handouts, as well as if you'd like to access closed captioning, click on the icon in the Zoom control panel. We welcome you today to COVID-19 and due process one year later with our hearing officers, attorney Brian Ford and attorney Charles, Charles Jelly. They are presented in alphabetical order. Their bios of the two hearing officers are extensive and available to you. I'll highlight specifics or else the majority of our time would be on reading their very accomplished bios and minimal time on our content. So let me start with attorney Brian Jason Ford, received his BA from Franklin Marshall College and his JD from Penn State Law Dickinson. He worked as a research assistant, studied ODR's mediation system while completing a state-by-state -state analysis of special education dispute resolution systems. In 2010, he's named as the Pennsylvania Super Lawyers Rising Star. He leaves private practice and attorney Ford became certified hearing officer by the National Association of Hearing Office Officials. Attorney Charles Jelly receives his undergraduate and master degree from Slippery Rock University. Attorney Jelly received his first law degree from Duquesne Law School and received his second law degree an LLM in health law from the University of Loyola School of Law, Institute of Health Law in Chicago, Illinois. He continues throughout his career with extensive and fascinating law practice work and then finds himself resuming school law practice in Westmoreland County. Attorney Jelly serves as a, has served as a solicitor for Parent Education Network. He's the past chairman of the Pennsylvania Bar Association Exceptional Children's Committee. Thank you both. We'll take questions as they arrive. We look forward to um, hearing some excellent content around COVID-19 due process one year later. Well, that's great. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Gina. Appreciate that very much. Uh, Charlie and I are very happy to be here with you today. Um, quick programming note. Uh, we know that we are, um, you have a choice as to what session you're going to be in today. Um, we're not the only game in town, so, so this is uh, COVID and due process one year later. If you had intended to be somewhere else, um, no, we won't take offense. Uh, <laughs> go where you need to be. Um, we are hoping that this will be an interactive presentation. Feel free to interrupt us. Feel free to, um, to, to raise your hand, to ask a question in chat. Um, uh, Gina will help us monitor that so that we can uh, make sure that your questions are answered. I'm going to share my screen at this point so you can see um, what we have prepared. Okay. Um, and also, I apologize in advance. One of the perils of working from home is that, that you really have very little control as to when uh, neighboring properties mow their lawns. So if you hear a lawnmower at any point today, I, I, I do apologize for that. Um, the topic of our presentation is, is COVID in due process one year later. Um, we need to begin with a disclaimer. Uh, the short version of this, of this disclaimer is that although uh, hearing officer Jelly and I are lawyers, we are not your lawyers, and what we are giving you here today uh, is not a substitute from uh, for legal advice that you would get from your lawyer. That should not dissuade you from asking questions. Please do ask whatever questions you have. Um, we, not, we may not be able to answer everything that you ask, but um, that should not stop you from, from asking. Worst comes to worst, we simply say that we can't answer that. Um, you should have access to a raise your hand feature and, and we can call on you. I believe we have the power to unmute you. I believe that we have the power to even enable your video if you want. Um, if you want to ask the questions in the chat, that's fine. You can, you can do that as well. So please do not hesitate. And I'm looking at the chat and we may already have, oh, we don't have a question. We simply have go rock. I think that that one's for you, Charlie. Uh, <laughs> Okay, 
Um, we should begin by saying where we are now. Um, I know that I'm talking to school people and I know that more often than not, it is parents who request due process hearings, not schools. Um, but this is my little PSA or soapbox, whatever you wanna call it, that if you happen to be the person requesting a due process hearing, please say in your complaint whether you want a in-person hearing or what we've started calling or have been calling a, a virtual hearing, a hearing via video conference. If you complete a due process complaint uh, on our website, there will be, that option will be presented to you and you'll have to make a selection. Um, most of the time folks draft their own so you can include that on your complaints. The majority of complaints that, that we're getting, and, and Charlie, you can say if your experience is different than mine, is that most of the time the complaints say nothing, and then we have to go through a process to, to consult with you to determine what your preferences are, and if that preference is in person exactly how we want to do that. Um, we are relying heavily on uh, case-specific and district-specific guidelines so um, we understand that the COVID situation is not the same in every geographic spot in Pennsylvania. Uh, and the COVID protocols in place in districts vary significantly district by district. Um, so we will be having that conversation with you more, more, accu more accurately with your attorneys at the outset of these cases. Um, and we will work with you to do what's best for your case um, but often we don't know what we don't know about what the situation is in your district. So if you don't say, we're going to ask. Um, Charlie, that's been your experience yes, as well? It has. Yeah. Um, I think that you're, uh, the districts are required at this point to have, to have protocols in place. So, so we will probably be taking a look at them on a case-by-case basis as well. Um, the pre-hearing directions haven't changed. Um, our processes for things like exhibits have not changed. Uh, it's just a question of whether or not we're doing it in person or remote. Um, and uh, I was quite surprised when, when we uh, made in-person hearings available again, because uh, I actually received more requests for remote or to remain in remote than I expected. Um, Charlie, anything to add on that? Um, no, it's my experience is similar to yours, Brian. Okay. Um, again, we were hoping for for a nice interactive session. Does does anyone have any questions on on sort of where we are as we sit here today before we take a look at what happened over the past over the past year about ODR protocols, anything like that? I don't see anything coming in. Um, Gina, is there something that I'm supposed to see that I'm not? I don't think so. No, you're that's seeing fine. what I'm seeing. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. So we'll move on then. Um, we wanted to present some data because I think that uh, COVID and due process is really the story of what did not happen. Um, this is a July to December comparison, 2019-20 to 2020-2021. Um, you can see that the July to December numbers for 2020-2021 are lower than the prior year. Um, the significance of that drop. I haven't done the math to say whether or not it's statistically significant. What I can tell you in my experience is that when COVID really struck for about a month, things really slowed down in terms of uh, folks pressing litigation that was pending and new filings coming in. And then after that, it was more or less business as usual. And then the next slide really does bear that out. Um, 
here we have full school year stats comparing the 1920 and 2021 school years. You can see that filings overall in um, 2021 were down, uh, but not by a lot. And a lot of that represents the slowdown in where, where, where COVID really hit and then picked back up. But what we didn't see, and this will not appear in the numbers in terms of filings, is that we did not see COVID issues presented discreetly. What does that mean? We were prepared and did a lot of work and did a lot of research to get complaints specifically about COVID. Um, complaints along the lines of something unique to the school shutdown for COVID or unique to how the district was handling COVID uh, is the source of the alleged violation. By and large, that simply did not happen. We were seeing the exact same kinds of complaints that we saw pre-COVID. The, um, the bad IEP cases where the allegation is that this IEP was not reasonably calculated to be appropriate at the time that it was drafted and presented. Those issues did not change substantively at all. Um, and that is the majority of what we get. Um, the IEP implementation cases took on a very particular COVID flavor, but even then it was not presented as a discrete case on its own. If IEP says do X, Y, Z and school closes and you can't do X, Y, Z, therefore for a period of time, the IEP was not implemented. Um, U.S. Department of Education released guidance saying that that's a claim, basically. And that claim was never, not even once to my knowledge, filed on its own. It was always part of a broader IEP case, always part of a broader denial of faith case where that period of time was always a sub issue and not the heart of the case. Um, we don't know what we don't know. I, I would be, I, I would suspect that part of that is a function of parents and schools talking to each other about things like COVID compensatory services. So we don't see the case that's never filed. We don't see the case that's functionally settled before it comes to us. Um, so there could be a larger number out there that we know nothing about, but I suspect it's not that much larger. And I suspect that the good communications that you're having about COVID compensatory, COVID compensatory services are part of that. But again, I don't know. Uh, we only see what's filed and things tend to be um, broken down by the time the filing occurs. Um, Charlie, what am I missing here? I, I agree. I think one of the early things that happened is, um, well, in preparing for today, I looked at the ODR database of decisions for hearing officers. Um, if you put the word COVID into the database and just do a search of that phrase, um, you'll find about 45 hits. Um, the early cases, uh, the first one occurred, the first time you see the word in the ODR database, um, and this is the database dealing with decisions by hearing officers, uh, it's like March 20th. Um, and it comes up just as a reference that schools were closing. Um, the early cases reference the phrase COVID and Basically, people did not make any claims. They talked about everything else but the school closing. Um, and that pretty much has continued through the most recent March, April, May cases are starting to break out the IEP from the beginning of the school year up to the close and then continuing on to the 20. 
2020-2021 school year. Um, so what that tells me is the universe of data out of this, 900, this 851 cases is really small from hearing officer decisions in Pennsylvania. Um, 45 cases is not enough to make any type of a trend analysis. And if you break that down, you probably have somewhere between eight to 12. And again, that's nothing to make any type of a trend line analysis because they're just so, so different in how the claims are fashioned and how they were presented. Um, when I look at the table, I wanna credit the LEAs and the district people. Uh, look at the number of mediations. That is great. With all the changes that were going on in the crazy land that everyone was in, mediation was still hopping. Look at the IEP facilitations. Change less, but still significant in terms of everything that was going on. Um, I would have expected more resolution meeting facilitations, but I think that, again, when facilitations broke down, people just went to the next level and said, we need to get to dispute resolution and move it forward. But overall, I think that the LEAs did a wonderful job in managing change and in instruction, change in due process, providing notices and making sure that things moved successfully through the dispute resolution process. Excuse I me. would, I'm sure, Brian go ahead. And John, yes, yes. Uh, I got a text. They did not want to put it in the chat in case it's a question that they should know. <laughs> they said, could you please explain the breakdown uh, across the top of your chart statewide fine yes. IU 26 and SDOP total, please? Yes. Okay. So the majority of due process hearings come from the school district of Philadelphia. IU 26 is the IU, and that's SDOP, School District of Philadelphia. IU 26 is the IU that serves the School District of Philadelphia. It is also the MAWA for the city of Philadelphia for early intervention. And it is also the IU for charter and cyber charter schools within the boundaries of Philadelphia. So Philadelphia skews the numbers significantly. So if you look at our top line, the 2020-21 uh, cases, uh, what you see is that of the 851, 262 of those were filed uh, in Philadelphia County, basically. Uh, and of those 262, 208 involved the school district of Philadelphia. There are no dumb questions. There are only dumb answers. Uh, so, so by all means, do, do, not be, uh, do not be embarrassed or ashamed to ask. And, uh, and, and thank you, uh, Gina, for facilitating that uh, for, for folks. Even if folks want to remain uh, anonymous, um, that's fine too. I, I, I don't think I, I was talking to, uh, to Gina and Charlie before we went on today. And I don't think that there are a lot of um, forums where school folks can just ask a hearing officer a question. Uh, so, so you should take advantage of this. Uh, even if it's a little bit off topic, that's fine. Um, I, I want to piggyback on, on something that Charlie mentioned a little bit about the way that um, LEAs are, are handling this period of time. Um, and yes, kudos for the mediation. Uh, we're also aware, although we don't have uh, numbers here today, we're also aware that uh, LEAs are saying yes more frequently to things like hearing officer settlement conferences. And I think that ODR's recent change to permit attorneys in ODR mediation um, is a good thing and will yield more use of mediation. And we see that as a percentage uh, of total cases filed uh, going forward. That's, that's a good thing. Um, I've seen two flavors of COVID compensatory services come up in hearings. Um, there are cases in which the parties are very purposefully not making an issue over whatever period of time the school was closed 
because the parties are talking about COVID compensatory services. That's been a good process, even in the middle of a due process hearing, that's been a good process. And they're confident that they can work out that period of time. The other flavor that I've had is where the response from the LEA to a request for compensatory education, where part of it would fall into the realm of COVID compensatory services, is when the response is, well, at some point we'll plan to have a plan and we'll let you know about it in the future. When that, when I see, and it's always an IEP implementation failure by the time it's presented to me during the period of school shutdown or during the transition to, to hybrid or virtual instruction, it's when that conversation goes poorly. So just like every other flavor of due process hearing, it usually starts with a communication breakdown. And I think that the way that schools are communicating about COVID compensatory education services um, plays a big role in whether or not we're seeing that issue presented in hearings or not. I see this chat starting to come in. Um, Oh, this is, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll link to, uh, it's, a, it's a link to your handout. Uh, okay, never mind. <laughs> I'll keep that window up on my screen. I don't, I don't know if uh, you see what I see here, but um, that way I won't be very hopeful when the chat comes in and then it's not a question. Um, Charlie, are you seeing uh, a difference in your cases based on the way that schools are, are handling and presenting uh, COVID compensatory services? Um, I have not had a, a significant number of cases where the COVID compensatory services have been, it, it came up. Um, the, one of the things that happened when schools closed is we were all brought into a new world of new names and phrases. And those phrases are taking on different definitions. Um, I had a hearing recently where the LEA was using the term compensatory education and compensatory services interchangeably and also using the term COVID compensatory education services. So everything is morphing into one and they are not the same. So there's a new definition set that's happening along with the definition set of what is a hybrid hearing, what is a hybrid education, is it a three-day in-school, two-day out-of-school, um, all of those mixes and matches based on the well-developed local health and safety plans just takes time to understand and understand what worked in that community as a circumstance of what was going on. Um, so to find what the cases call a fine grained analysis of the circumstances is really taking on, I can't say a new twist, taking on its well-meaning directional twist to understand what happened. Um, the words are not yet defined because they're just starting to be used. Um, you know, I have to ask in every hearing that I do when people use the word synchronous and asynchronous because what does it mean where you are? Um, at the beginning of the school shutdown, I had several charter school cases that were virtual to begin with. And in those environments, they're just very, very different. Um, they were constructed to be virtual. They did things that were, some might consider gee whiz. I mean, there were aides pre-placed into the breakout rooms. There were children placed in breakout rooms with one-on-one -on -one aides. It was just a whole different flavor of how to use the technology. There were instructional coaches placed into the virtual learning environments for the teachers to rely on. Teachers were getting consistent feedback about their virtual instruction. I mean, it's just a different platform with a different number of people who were set up to run virtual instruction as opposed to 
we closed, we reopened, we restarted in a new way, and we were forced to adapt, improvise, and overcome on the, on the go. And people did great jobs. Um, hearings went down, mediation stayed consistent, facilitations where there were disputes changed. Um, I thought it was great that we didn't see a rash of extended school year standalone due process requests because of the shutdown. I mean, if we were going to see something happen, that would have been a good blip to understand what people were thinking. It just didn't happen. Why? I don't know. Grateful that it didn't because people were focusing on what was going on rather than what was they wanted created. Um, that may change in the future as things begin to settle down. Um, yeah. I, Charlie, I think that that bears highlighting. Um, my sense. Ryan, oh, yes. There's some questions that are coming oh, there's in some if questions. you're reading it very, from your very good. you'd like me to. Yeah, no, let me, let me just highlight something that, that, that Charlie said there. Uh, and then, I'll, then I, I, I do see the questions in the chat. Thank you, Gina. Um, you're welcome. The... Um, one of the and this is this is anecdotal and and purely my perspective uh, and and my perspective might be wrong and and, and if my perspective is wrong I'll, I'll rely on on you good people to tell me um, but I I think that for for a moment um, as, as as COVID rolled out and schools shut down um, there was a there was a real feeling of we're all in this together um and and i think that that also contributed to some of the increased requests for mediation as, at least as a percentage uh some of the um so, some of the delayed filings or more of the we will figure this out outside of a due process hearing um my perspective could be skewed my my perspective could be simply wrong i do not have numbers to back up what i'm saying um but i think that that um that is something that we saw a bit of and I think that it may be reflected in the numbers that we're presenting. Let me turn now to the, the questions. Um, we, have, we have a comment about um, COVID compensatory services not being presented well in, in Philadelphia. Um, how long does a parent have to request due process in regard to COVID concerns? The, the guidance from the uh, federal government uh, mirrored largely at this point by the state is that the school shutdowns did not change or alter the rights of children with disabilities. What I take from that is that there's no special carve out statute of limitations for COVID cases. And as a result, um, in, in, unless something new happens or something happened that I'm unaware of, um, I would analyze a COVID specific claim uh, the same way that I would analyze a, a non-COVID due process claim uh, if there's a dispute regarding the statute of limitations, because the claim in a strict sense is not really about COVID. It's about the impact on COVID on the student's education and how the district did or did not respond to that. So school shuts down. The claim isn't school shut down. The claim is you didn't implement the student's IEP. Uh, and an IEP implementation case is an IEP implementation case regardless of the reason why. Now, I'm not so naive as to completely ignore the context, but um, the analysis for purposes of statute of limitations, I think would be the same. Charlie, are you seeing that differently than I am? I, right now I have not seen in, uh, anything different than what you've said. Um, so I think the rule of thumb until it gets changed is going to be, you had two years from when you either knew or should have known is what the statute said. Um, now, the predicament in that phrasing of the statement of the problem is, what did you know and what were you supposed to know? Um, strict it always is. <laughs> strict interpretation will be two years from the date that it stopped being implemented you should have been jumping up and down and saying, we want something. So somewhere in March of 2022 to June of 2022, when school closed, would be the window opening and closing on how long you have to file your COVID claims. Um, 
COVID specific failure to implement claims or whatever you wanted to identify as the action that forms the basis of the complaint. Um, at the same time, if there was a claim that happened in the 2020-22 school year, that the denial occurred there, the comp ed, how you calculate it is different than when you file the claim. Um, we're not trying to talk around it. It's the same as if you were in school, the school's never closed. How long do you have to file a claim? Two years from when you either knew or should have known that the accident forms the basis of the complaint. That's what the lawyers will factually fight about. That's what the new or should have known hearing will be about. Um, and that's what the emails or text messages or posting on the district's websites will be about. At least as we understand the rule is as applied now. That that's that's absolutely right, Charlie. And and I think that it just shows that when it comes to knowing it comes to special education law, um, knowing the rule isn't enough. That's why some of you have lawyers on speed dial, uh, because you can know the rule, but then how the rule applies to your case is unique to your case. Um, so we're going to be seeing a lot of argument about how that rule applies to these cases that may come in post-COVID, um, and we're going to get a lot of argument on that, I would expect. Um, two more questions in chat, and this is great. Uh, are you able to make projections, usually not, uh, for the 2021-22 school year when LEAs face the potential learning losses? I think that what this goes to is that in 21-22, um, we may have a better sense of how the school closures and how the year of remote or hybrid or what have you, and this varies significantly district to district, what impact that actually had on kids. One of the things that, that may happen, and I don't know, and I'm certainly not making a projection, is that once the, what I'll call the scope of the harm is known, at that point we may see an increase in filings. And I don't know if that's true or not, but this is what COVID compensatory education is supposed to address. Um, PDE, uh, if you and, and the term COVID compensatory education comes from PDE guidance, and the guidance is just that. It's guidance. It's not law. But what PDE said is you ought to be taking a look at these kids, um, do some type of analysis to see uh, whether or not there was harm, and if that harm needs to be re remediated, offer something that PDE is calling COVID compensatory services to remediate that harm. Um, exactly what that looks like and how it will work, I think, will be very different district to district. That's way, uh, and that, you know, as Charlie said, when we get into a case, people use these terms interchangeably and the terms mean different things in different districts. So you'll be getting questions from us, if not from your lawyers, about what does this mean and how do we present it so that the hearing officer understands what we're talking about. Um, so we will, we will cross that bridge when we get there. So I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not able to, the, able to answer the question, not because it's, it's a lawyer thing or something like that. I'm not able to answer the question because I don't know. I understand why, you, why there might be a thought about an uptick, um, but I would encourage you to look to PDE guidance on COVID compensatory services, because I think that that guidance plus some really good, honest, open communication may be your, your best path to avoid due process. I happen to believe that good, honest, and open communication is the best way to avoid, to avoid due process, full stop. Um, but I think that's especially true in, in these times. Um, Let me take a different tact on the question. Sure. Um, learning loss right now, as it's used, is a regular education term or loss of learning. Um, if you look at the regular education literature about learning loss, it's always happened. Schools closed in May, they reopened in August, and there's always been a summer learning loss. There's been some research with learning loss over school closures due to um, storms, hurricanes, disasters, and what happened uh, after the disaster. Um, Katrina, 
Harvey, Maria, all of the hurricanes that shut down certain segments of society. Um, so that's a regular education term. And as I read it coming out of the US Department of Education, learning loss is a regular education term. For us in the IEP 504 type world is did whatever happened cause a denial of faith? So there could be potentially a loss of learning, but not a denial of faith that is caused by a failure to implement. You know, it, it, there needs to be a link back to the IEP. Was the IEP reasonably calculated? Was that reasonably calculated IEP not implemented? And is there a defense for not implementing it? I mean, I don't think anybody can, in good faith, argue successfully. And please understand, I qualified that three different ways. Good faith argued successfully that from March 13th, when schools closed, until after the General Assembly said you could do something different and restart, that people expected that your kids could have been in school. I mean, the world hit the big pause button and then hit the big red restart button and it all started to rumble through. Um, yeah. Even on right. compensatory education, the case law says the district is given a reasonable rectification period. Even if it was done wrong, written wrong, implemented wrong, there's a reasonable rectification. What that looks like in terms of compensatory education for failures and violations of the statute we don't know. It hasn't been argued. It hasn't been presented that I'm aware of in the 45 cases, 49 cases that you see in the ODR database. And even if you go into the ODR database and you put the word pandemic in, mm -hmm. you'll see that comes up like 41 times, which is different than the number of times you see COVID. So again, learning loss hasn't been defined within the regular education. How much loss do you have to get before you get eligible for regular education learning law services, if any. Right. Gene, I see, I see you trying to chime in here because uh, we, we, we tend to go on and on and <laughs> you're, you're trying to rein us in. Um, oh, that's fine. I just want to make sure to address, um, you saw one about if the family made a complaint to PDE. Uh, let, let, me, let me see here. Um, potential learning... I'll be glad to read it if you'd like. Yeah, oh, yes, please. Makes, Go ahead. If, if a family makes a complaint to PDE and the school mm -hmm. district works to address the concerns and offers comp ed plus additional hours of comp ed as a gesture of good faith to ensure that the student receives support needed to progress, would this be taken into consideration when moving to a due process situation in the future? if the parent is still not pleased with programming and or progress? That's, that's an interesting question. Um, the PDE com, uh, complaint investigation process and the, the special education due process hearing um, are very different processes. Um, and the extent to which ODR hearing officers are bound by PDE determinations um, is a question of some debate. Um, what I can tell you is, um, do we consider the circumstances? Of course we consider the circumstances. We, can, we consider everything. Um, if you look at a due process decision, uh, any due process decision, pick anyone you want, um, they all include a section called findings of fact. And the findings of fact are usually a very detailed chronology of everything that happened. Um, we look at it all. Um, in a typical due process case, hundreds if not thousands of pages are entered into evidence. We read it all. And then we make these, uh, these decisions based on the facts presented. So in order to say how this one fact implements a broader case, um, I can't do that without saying, tell me everything. Um, there was, and then I'd be making a case specific call if for your hypothetical, which is something that I'm not allowed to do. Um, 
I used to represent schools. There was a period of time where I represented families. There was a period of time where I represented schools. I had um, uh, a, a special education teacher once asked me, a client asked me, just tell me what a FAPE is. I'm more than happy to give it. I just need to know what it is. And the answer to that question, it, it's not answerable because it is student specific. Uh, a moment ago, we were we were asking, uh, we were talking about how simply knowing the rule when for purposes of case analysis, I understand that your job is not case analysis, you're teachers. But for case analysis, um, the, the per, the, what, we, what we do is we, we look at the facts of a particular case and make a case specific call. Um, so you really do have to look at the totality of all of the circumstances and that's our process as well. So this is not a question that I can answer um, because I don't have enough information to answer it. And if I did, I probably couldn't. Um, in terms of the PDE, uh, you know, if, if you have, um, if you're under corrective action after a complaint investigation, and then the question presented to us is whether or not the, the steps that you took in response to the corrective action is enough, we have to decide that on the case in front of us. One of the things... Go ahead. One of the things that happens is there are three different wells of data on any dispute system. Well one, and this is not in rank order, we have due process hearings that give us information. We have Office of Civil Rights complaints investigation that gives us information about trend lines. We have state education agency investigations of complaints. Please note, OCR does an investigation. State education agencies do investigations. Due process hearings are fact-finding adjudications. We make decisions. We don't do investigations. Um, the differences between those systems comes up with different types of outcomes at time. To the extent that the LEA worked with the department and to the extent that there was an offer, obviously that would come in. Um, and it would be factored into whatever decision is rendered. Um, just like if there was an IEP meeting and there was an offer and the offer was rejected. Here, we said we were gonna do X, Y, and Z, and A, B, and C. All of that comes in and it goes through that fact-finding process, what was reasonably calculated to allow meaningful educational benefit. So is it helpful? Yes. Is it indication of trying to find something that's reasonably calculated? Yes. Is it reasonably calculated? I don't know. Exactly right. Exactly right. Um, one that's gathering a lot of chatter. If a yes. district offered compensatory summer classes and supports and a parent did not take advantage of it for their child, how does that fare legally? Is that taken into consideration? Sure. Everything is taken into consideration, just like we said. Um, how that applies in your case is case specific. So picture two different scenarios. Um, we look at, um, we look at, uh, do, do we, we as a district do an independent analysis, our own analysis and, and determine that a student is owed COVID compensatory services. And we say, okay, as our offer of COVID compensatory services is this camp. Well, it's not did the parent accept or reject that offer in isolation, it's was that offer any good? Um, how does that relate to the student's needs? What was going to be done in that camp to remediate the particular harm that, that student suffered? Because by offering it, you're saying we are acknowledging some amount of harm here. Well, tell me about that harm. Tell me about the kid. Tell me everything because parents have every right to reject services that are not appropriate. And if what you offered was insufficient, um, then, you know, offering something that doesn't solve the problem doesn't solve the problem. And then you're in hearing. Um, so it is, it is not a question of, did I make an offer and did the parents take it? It is a question of, tell me about the kid. Tell me what the kid needs. How did 
what I offer square with what the kid needs. And in that sense, it is no different than any other faith case. Uh, it's, it's not something special or unique because we're calling it COVID compensatory services. There was a question in chat about definitions and definitions of COVID compensatory services. That term, uh, you, can, you can find it through PDE. That term came from PDE guidance that's available. Um, it, I know for sure it's available on the PDE website. I don't know how it was uh, uh, disseminated to schools. Um, where where PDE is saying this is the process that you ought, that we advise you to engage in, it, it's it's not a law, it's not a regulation, it's guidance from PDE. But in terms of whether or not a student's right to faith was violated, um, it's it's no different than when a parent rejects a NORAP and says this NORAP was inappropriate. Um, we need to know a lot more before we can answer the question, and and there's every reason to believe that in the in the coming weeks, months, years, I, I don't know what the horizon looks like. I, sus I would be very surprised if there was zero litigation on the appropriateness of COVID compensatory education services. Based on our experience with COVID in general, um, I don't think I'm on a limb by saying that it's gonna be less than everyone thinks, um, but I, don't, I think that the number is gonna be bigger than zero. Um, during the previous school year, quite a few virtual students did not engage in the learning process. IP teams reconvened multiple times. Students did not earn enough credits to pass the year. IEPs will reconvene again at the start of the new year to be proactive. Is there anything else these teams should consider to avoid any potential due process concerns? You will never avoid every potential due process concern. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, however, um, I, I, would, I would acknowledge um, I think that a little extra care and sensitivity is probably warranted. Um, I think that how you go about communicating is important. I think that if it's already a difficult relationship, it may become more difficult and perhaps there is good, good reason to bring in a facilitator. Um, but I think that it is... I think that your best chance is good, honest, open communication. This is where we were. This is what happened. This is where we are. This is what we think is needed to bring your child from point A to point B. And we think that um, that trip from point A to point B is appropriately ambitious and responsive to your child's needs. Um, when you say these things, it has to be true. You actually have to do the work before you're in the meeting. And I know that you do, or at least try to. Um, so, so do that hard work before the meeting. Um, not predetermination, just real analysis as to what the student needs. And then come in and have that conversation with mom and dad. Um, real open, real honest. You, you, you can't, I think that when schools get into trouble saying everything was great, you know, nothing to see here. Uh, we're just going to keep on keeping on. Um, because I do think that some students really took COVID hard, really did not have, really had trouble with, with online instruction, really had trouble with hybrid, really had trouble with the massive disruptions. Add to that, you know, grown up, grown ups felt stress, kids felt stress too. <laughs> and that's just the reality of the situation. Um, that, that doesn't mean that it's an IEP due process claim uh, or, or an IDA due process claim. What it does mean is that going forward, um, really taking the time to have that communication, really taking the time to make sure that the IEP team meeting has a good productive conversation is probably wise. Someone's asking, what is the role of the facilitator? Um, that, is, that is a free service that's offered by ODR where we can send in a trained facilitator to help the IEP team meeting not necessarily go smoothly, but to help the, help schools and parents communicate with each other. Um, Charlie, what what non legal advice have I failed to give? I, I don't I don't think you failed anything. I think <laughs> I would answer the question this way: um, What assume the school never closed? Johnny went to class every day and put his head on the desk. He showed up every day without a book. 
he showed up every day without any materials, what would the IEP team do to recalculate, recalibrate, or restart Johnny's IEP? Now, if you would do nothing for Johnny, I think you got a problem. If you come back after the virtual education program not being what it was supposed to be, and you do nothing, I think you got a problem. Um, if you look at it, offer something that's different, hit the restart button, you have an affirmative defense that you were trying to provide a free appropriate public education. So what would you do? How would you do it? Why did you do it? When did you do it? And why didn't you do some things? The same IEP process that always worked didn't change. Maybe it's because their internet connection was lousy. Maybe it's because the kid had a massive executive functioning problem that nobody knew was there. But when you put them in the box and you put something up synchronously, asynchronously on this schedule that was variable, checked out. It's, there were so many variables. How do you contain them? How do you recalculate them? How do you recalibrate? Same old stuff that you've been doing every day. Where you were, what data did you get? What data didn't you get? How did you analyze it? And what did you discuss? What did you decide on? And did you do it? I think that's right. I, I, I see another question in the chat that we may have missed. Uh, have have we seen uh, cases about one-on-one -on -one aids not being sent in homes during closure? I have not. The the closest that I've seen to that is a case that went the other way, where the school district was presenting evidence and information about how, despite COVID, we found a way to get people into the student's home uh, with various safety procedures and things like that. Um, and then there was, you know, conversation about how, how frequently or how consistently that happened or how beneficial it was. Um, the only time I've ever seen it come up is when a school district brought it up to say, look at um, the Herculean effort that we've made. Um, which is not to say that it will never come up in the future, which is not to say that, um, you know, it, it, this will not be an issue uh, going forward. I don't know whether or not it will be. Um, what we if if past is prologue, we'll see less of that than we think that we're going to see. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I, I don't have the prescience to to answer that question going forward. But but my experience to date has been it's it's almost a non-issue. And 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 maybe Charlie sees sees the same. We just got a five minute warning, <laughs> so I'll stop going on and on and on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, there, um, there is one recent due process decision in Pennsylvania where the aid issue was raised. Um, the district, the ruling was in favor of the family. Um, and I would expect, as in all things in special education, that it will be appealed um, because it's in the fancy word for it that lawyers have is an issue of first impression. Um, just because I could send an aid doesn't mean I should send an aid. And is there competing interest between sending someone into that environment? and the risk of harm. I mean, there's gonna be all new types of affirmative defenses that are going to occur. Um, due process hearings happen. Appeals will take anywhere from six to 18 months at the district court level and six to 18 months tops at the third circuit level. We're two and a half years away from answering that question to understand it as a trend, as opposed to what happened in one particular case. Mm -hmm. um, that gives no one any predictability, but that's how long it takes to bake this cake. I mean, even when courts are moving quickly, 
Um, and I, I, I reached this conclusion because I've been working in looking at appeal rates and decision rates at the district court. Sometimes they happen quick based on the court's docket, but I think you're looking at six top 18 months. Third Circuit moves quicker, um, quicker when they don't have argument and they just write decisions. Um, but you're looking at a good two years before we know if that is a trend that's actionable and under what specific conditions it will or will not be actionable. So we'll have we'll have uh, clearer answers right as the statute of limitations runs out. Um, <laughs> Pretty much. I, I, so, something something to highlight there in the little bit of time that we have left. I, I want to take a moment to caution against extrapolation from due process decisions to the unique facts of your case. Um, Charlie talked about the number of hits that you get when you look at the ODR database, which you have access to through our website, uh, and, and, and type in COVID or COVID-19 or, 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 or terms along those lines. Um, even when I have a, a decision that has nothing to do with COVID, I usually take note somewhere in the decision, you know, on, on whatever date schools shut down in response to COVID. So that's a case that has nothing to do with COVID that will have that word in it. Um, but even when you look past that and say, hey, um, what happened in, are there any cases in which X, Y, Z happened? You can probably find a case in which X, Y, Z happened. And you can look at that case and say, oh, every time X, Y, Z happens, um, this is the result because that's what happened in this case. And that's wrong. Um, these are case specific determinations. So you can have two cases with similar facts that yield different results because the facts are not the same. The I in IEP is individual, right? We are making decisions for one student that cover one period of time. So before when I was talking about the tell me everything so that I can make a decision, that applies in every case. So just because district gave XYZ to, to, to student number one, does not mean that the same result will happen when student gives X, Y, Z to student no number two, when district gives X, Y, Z to student number two. That's why we do data collection. That's why we have individualized processes. So you can look to cases to get a better understanding of the, the rules and the analysis, the, the type of analysis that we do. What you cannot do is you cannot look at a case and say, this will be the same every time because no case is the same because no kid is the same. Well, I wanna thank you very much. We have a recommendation to look at, check out ZB versus Upper Marion. We also had a lot of laughing out loud when you said you can never avoid a due process. So we thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Don't take that too far out of context, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, people found that very humorous. And as always, you bring such a genuine um, consensus to complex problems. And I appreciate the work of both you and Charlie and all the other hearing officers and the Office for Dispute Resolution for what you do, especially under these most challenging times. And I thank you. Everybody's also waiting for the code, which is in chat. Um, and it is O-D-C-P-5, as well as please remember to, at the end of the session today, the survey will be up for you to complete. Remember your Act 48 um, hours um, for yesterday's attendance or today's attendance, and that survey will be open today at 3.30. The link is there. 
Um, lots of kudos for you guys. Excellent. Love listening to you. Great information. Thank you. Great session. Very informative. Uh, still laughing about due process. Um, the code again, I will tell you is O D C P five. O as in other, D as in dog, C as in cat, P as in Paul, number five. Thank you very much. Remember, the Thank next you, session Tina. starts at 1120. It's a pleasure being with you guys, as always. Thank, Thank you. you Tina. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Really appreciated your assistance there. I was monitoring the uh, closed captioning because we'll put in words, Coven became COVID all the time. <laughs> uh, my gosh, we had, um, if we said, when we talked about Charlie, it would come up as trolley. Um, the early 80s was LEAs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> MMA is Mawa. <laughs> I, I think I think that um, I think that a uh, a COVID in the eighties and COVID nineteen are different things. <laughs> yeah, and the one when you talked about fate, it came up. As